everyone, and this is Be My Guest with Mary Honan on Liramedia.tv and supporting the Samaritans, Limerick and Tipperary. And my guest today, oh God, you don't know how much I'm looking forward to this interview, is the uh, anyone who in Irish dancing uh, will know will know Danny Doherty, uh, originally from Donegal. And it's Danny's birthday today. Happy birthday, Danny. <laughs> No, thank you very much, Mary. I don't want to be celebrating any more birthdays. I'm not getting any older now. I'm still <laughs> thinking more 21. Are you going to be like June Deegan Way and not and refuse to grow old gracefully? Oh, definitely. You're just going to just go with the flow. No, oh, I just keep going till they throw me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, my service is no longer required. Because I interviewed Terry and Philip the other day, and Terry thinks that it might retire him. And I said, "Are you?" And, and, and Philip said he's never going to retire again or say he's retiring because he said no one would believe him because he retired the last time and came back again. So you're never going to retire, Danny. Oh well, I tried. I did try a few years ago, um, but uh, I was dragged back into it like everything else in my life. Everything just happens, and uh, I end up not realizing I'm, I'm back to where I started. <laughs> That's the perfect start, uh, Danny. Where did Danny Doherty start Irish dance? You, you, you were brought up in Donegal. Tell me about the young <laughs> Danny Doherty. Well, God, that would be some story, Mary, would need all week. Uh, I was born in Tandrigi, Clamani. Uh, in any show in County Donegal, and uh, that's my home base, and always has been, even though I've lived in England for the last over fifty years. Yeah, but but that's uh, home. And Clamani and the homeland has always been very dear to me, and I never felt that I left it. I'm only here. I feel that I've only come to England. For a space of time, yeah. But I always went back, and this is my longest spell out of Donegal, in all those years because of this lockdown and all the what's going on. Uh, we left home, and I always say home, meaning Donegal. Yeah, my heart in Ireland. <laughs> in September, and then we'd usually go back at Christmas, and then. We normally then the All Ireland and we take a run up home then again, and then at Easter for a couple of weeks, and then on to the summer we usually have five to six weeks in the summertime there. So this is my longest spell away for as long as I can remember. My I'm uncle really is looking forward to going home now. Uh, we're booked to go home on the twenty fourth. And I'm looking forward to that very much and hope to stay till the middle of September. Probably we have to stay longer if they, if they bring in a, another quarantine. Um, no, they, they've, they've actually paused the um, stage four of the, um, of the lockdown. They were supposed to be coming out of lockdown. They've decided to pause it last night on oh. August uh, 10th to open pubs. Um, there was a woman on the radio today crying her heart out because um, everything they've bought for to open up the pub will have to be thrown out now and, oh, they have, and they'll have to pay for everything that they bought. Do you know it's, it's just... It's a very hard time for business people. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's just beggar's belief and yet the airports are, are working as normal, it seems. Do you know, with yeah. people coming and going and no quarantine or being advised to quarantine, but you know, you can be advised all your life, but we'll do people when, when they come. But Danny, um, what made you decide, I suppose, how did you take up Irish dancing? Well, uh, coming from a, a rural village, what I did came from, there was no activities in my day. You didn't have all the sports and activities and everything that went on. And one day the uh, priest came into the school and he announced there was going to be an Irish dancing class opening in the Prokill Hall on Saturday and that he brought this dancing teacher from Derry and to make sure everyone supported it. 
So, of course, I was always dancing mad anyway. Yeah. I used to be dancing in the house and uh, we used to have what they call big nights and parties. And uh, we were fortunate enough we had a kitchen and a hall big enough they could take an eight hand. And uh, they used to be doing the, the set dancing and the lancers and all the old time dancing and set dancing. So, uh, well, sorry for interrupting, but was your were you all Irish speaking? Were you was it a bit? No, area? No. no, our area was all English because we were only 20 miles from Derry, okay. it was the West Donegal over on the other side of the Swilly where you had all the guilt, you know. Yeah, so up we go anyway on the Saturday, and to the whole school was there. There was about a hundred of us in this hall going mad running around. And uh, the first lesson I learned was uh, how to collect money in a dancing class. <laughs> he sat us all down around this hall. Didn't everyone deep. learn that lesson? And she sat us down and she went round from one to one with her two hands open. And you drop your one and sixpence into it. And when her hands couldn't hold no more, she would go over to the little divandy bag with a bag and drop it in and start collecting it again. <laughs> so I thought to myself, good God almighty, there's great money in this, even though I was, I think it was about nine at the time. So uh, then she got us up on the floor and everybody joined hands around the, uh, the ring and we all learned our sevens on the first lesson, you know. So that was the start and that was my first lesson, that was my first experience. So uh, I kept going back and there was about uh, six boys from my class that was going, you know. Yeah. We had a great time and we eventually, we, she, those days she just taught the, and to learn uh, the double jig and, uh, and she taught us a slip jig. That was unusual, really, because uh, yeah. did you ever teach the slip jig to boys yourself? I did. Uh, I did for uh, for lift. Yeah. And to, to be light on their feet. Yeah. It was, a, you know, an experiment I did, you know. Yeah, I taught it as well. And actually one of my boys won it every time he danced it, which I wasn't sure whether that was. Uh, he was delighted. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So we progressed on from there and. Eventually, uh, there was no facious and there was no, no nothing down with us at all, you know. Uh, so we were going for about a year and she, or by the way, her name was Mary McLaughlin from Derry. I okay. didn't know whether I said that or not. Uh, okay. She was very nice and I got on with her very well. But anyway, uh, she put on a, a class competition. And... Class, that was the first experience of a class competition. And then we used to be inundated with Christian brothers coming to the, the village for the summer holidays with two small hotels. And there'd be a sports day. And uh, they put on Irish dancing up in the back of a lorry. And these Christian brothers would be judging us. I don't know whether they knew anything about dancing or not. But they looked the part anyway. And we always got a... A quarter of Oatfield sweets is the prize we got, <laughs> or a bar of chocolate. They were very innocent times, weren't they? Oh, God. They so. weren't looking for stages or anything, or, oh. or, or marley flooring, or sprung flooring, or anything like that. Just a quarter oh, of, yeah, a, of sweets. Definitely not. <laughs> we thought we were great. Or Danny Doherty trophies. Yeah, well, that was a long time <laughs> later. So... Uh, then it, we, we, we eventually then, uh, the, she thought uh, you have to qualify to get for to go out to an open fish and the only open fish that we would have would be in Derry. So she entered us for uh, so many of us for the fish there at Colin Kill, which was held at Easter. And uh, so that was a big experience. So that was our major that was like a world going yeah. to Derry yeah. and if you're doing three or four dances you maybe you only had one dance today and another dance tomorrow 
And where I was from, took the bus an hour and 45 minutes to get from Clemani to, to Derry, you know. But fortunately, I had an uncle living in William Street, which was really five minutes walk from the Guildhall. And I used to stay with them maybe for a couple of nights and then get the bus back down. So I was fortunate in that way, you know. So I picked up a few prizes there and we had an eight hand and we actually won that to her surprise because <clears throat> she had a, a very good class in Derry itself and they had all the costumes and uniforms and we had blue short trousers on us and a it, white shirt. It just showed the talent. And, and a, a green tie and sure that was us. Yeah. So that was how I started off and that's... Where it went. Did you did you work at anything other than I suppose Irish dancing, or what? When you actually came to eighteen or seventeen or whatever, you decided. Did you decide then to be a, or did you always want to be a dancing teacher, or did you have another um, uh, career yeah. path before it? Irish dancing to me, and it always has been as a, it was always a hobby. And everybody used to think that you know that. Irish dancing was my life, and that's how I made my living. Uh, far from it. Uh, when I went to England, I was 17, and yeah. uh, we lived in a house around the corner uh, from St Mary's Church in Hillfields. And one day, I was out the back, and I could hear this Irish music. The club was just next door there's really a wall dividing us so i walked around and uh of course the music got me going and i had to be nosy and into the and there was a girl there called evelyn jackson and her sister from galway teaching a class yeah in marius so i went in and there was quite a few kids there and uh, there was about eight senior dancers so I went in for a nose anyway, and Evelyn met me and delighted and all the rest of it. And making a long story short, I ended up dancing with Evelyn, myself and the sister, doing shows and different things. Yeah. And ended up helping her. And that's how I got back into dancing and learned a lot from Evelyn, uh, what she had, because she danced for... Uh, Oh, she was from uh, Athlone. Mary Simpson Daly, is it? Yeah. Daly Simpson Daly. Daly Simpson Daly School. Yeah, and then uh, Maria Flaherty in Galway. Yeah, Mark yeah. So that's who they dance for all their lives. Yeah. So then it went on then that uh, I was enjoying doing what I was doing, but it was always just something we like doing, you know, and going out and doing shows. and. But it's surely not now a, 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 a hobby for you, Denny, because I would, have, I would be in the camp where I would have thought that it was your life's blood. Do you know, I mean, any, anywhere you go in the world at, at, to a, at a championships or that, Danny Doherty is there. Now, I know you have to, it's something you either, you have to love and you have to be passionate about, but it was more than just a hobby for you, Danny. That's the way I would have seen it and the way yeah. I did see it. Yeah, well, the way it happened, you see, it was, it was my social life. That's yeah. was my, uh, that was my let out in life. And that's all what I wanted to do. But I didn't make it, uh, I didn't make it hard work. Yeah. I, always, I always had the attitude, you know, this is a hobby. This is what I like to do. And if you like what I'm doing, fine. And if you don't like what I'm doing, move on. So I never had headaches, nor I'd ever entertain parents. Because I used to say to them, you know, if you're not happy here, there's another 10 schools five minutes away. And yeah. uh, your money wouldn't even buy me 20 cigarettes. Uh, but Danny, with all due respects, you have how many? A hundred and something uh, world champions now. Um, yeah. At, at um, in every in, whether it's in teams or solos. Yeah, Kaylee. Solos. Kaylee solos um, figures every um, every every form of of uh, every genre of Irish dance uh, competition. 
you 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 have world champions in it and you, yes. you have a spectacular record so you can you can be if you like um blase about it and you can say to people let move on do you know there's another 10 schools because you have the record behind you do you know and someone like me couldn't say that to 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 somebody just move on you'd be you'd be yeah. over them because you don't it was a fortunate it was a fortunate position to be in but you know when i started out i never dreamt for a minute that i would get so involved with it yeah and it's like everything in my life that I stumbled across and progressed with it. And before I knew where I was, I had a good class and a lot of students and they were doing well. And mm -hmm. one thing led to another and you just kept going like, you know, yeah. and then you, built, you kind of built in that. And when you had success coming back at you, then I used to set a goal. Well, um i'll have to do i didn't win that this year but i'll make not this year i'll win it next year yeah you know and then i'd set that goal and sure as god i've often not often but i went to the world one year and i got seven seven seconds and one first and uh i, I was raging i was sitting <laughs> I was sitting you beside didn't look at the glass half full. You saw the glass half empty when the seven yeah, exactly. seconds were. I happened to be sitting beside Carl Scanlon in Birmingham, a great friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. And I said to her, the results was coming out. And I said, if this is another sec second, I says, I'll fucking die. And she said to me, she says, if I got a fucking second, she says, I'll be swinging from that chandelier up there. She says, we're in Galway. So, yeah. uh, Here's God, it was a second. And uh, but anyway, and back the following year and I got the seven firsts and the one second. There's some of your teams there in the back. Good goal. There's a great friend of mine there, Betty Kelly. Betty she was Kelly. she did a lot to encourage me in dancing. Yeah. And uh it was very funny how you meet people. Oh, there's Carl Scanlon down below. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh god, you're doing a photograph that Carl wasn't in with you. <laughs> and that's John beside her, is it? Yeah, it's John and you. Oh, very good. Wow. So, going back to Betty Kelly, uh, I don't know whether I have time to tell you the story or not. But No, talk away. We have plenty of time. The, uh, we can have a part I, two of it. <laughs> how I met Betty was uh, we were at Fish in Coventry. Oh, I'm going back 35, 40 years maybe. And uh, she was, she was a violinist, she played at the Faces, you know. Yeah. And uh, I had a few entries and I was up the side of the stage and guiding them on, guiding them off and greenhorns, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, Betty said to me, she said, uh, you live in Coventry? She said, I said, I do, surely. She said, uh, oh, have you a spare bed? She said. I said, surely to God. She says, well, she said, I'm going home with you the night, she said. Good God, I said. She says, well, the house I stayed in last night, she said, I got nothing to eat since I left Manchester. And I got no breakfast this morning, she says, I've got nothing. And she says, I know, she says, have a go with you, she says, I'll get fed. And that that's was my... for sure, that's for sure, Danny. That's for sure. So that was my introduction to Betty. Betty came home with me that night, and I had a housekeeper called uh, Enid. She was with me for 28 years. She was like a second mother to me. And uh, her and Betty struck up great friendship. And from that day to the day Betty stopped being able to travel, Betty never left our house. Really? Every, no. She, every time she came down, all I would get to in the evening would be, uh, I'm at the station, come and collect me. <laughs> you know. And she'd be playing for all different people, nothing to do with me. But I had to go and collect her, bring her home up to my house, and off she'd go. Uh, but in those early days, too, you know, she, she used to put on faces in Manchester, a one day face, like, you know, and uh, you're sending me down a, 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 maybe a handwritten bit of a syllabus, you know, and we're having a face this day, and come on up, and you'll do all right, like, you know. So I'd throw them into the 
a car and get a couple of car loads and we'd head up to Manchester. <coughs> and uh, so this one of the first days times we went up. I was looking up and I could see no judge at all up at the table. And I thought, so how the hell is she getting the results and what's she happening? You know? As well, isn't she? Huh? She used to play the music and collect the money as well. What she was doing. And she had a woman sitting beside her on the side of the stage and she was telling her what to, what to write down. <laughs> and, uh, and that's how she judged it. The woman knew nothing. She had to tell her to go, oh, give that one so we'll know the rest of it. But I'll tell you one thing, she was a master at it. And uh, she would hit them up, poke in the back with the bow to tell them the next three on, like, you know, if she was under pressure. Oh, it was great crack. Yeah, I heard but, she used to play the accordion, judge, and take the money at the same time. Yeah, oh, she was a master. So, but I'll tell you one thing, and it took me years afterwards to cop on. All the children I had up there, they all, none of them ever came home without a medal. Yeah. Well, I, made, I, made Kelly, I can remember meeting June and Mary Kelly for the first time at the Betty Kelly Fesh we judged. And I was only telling Terry and Philip the other day and June and the three of us had the same winners the, from first to 10. So that naturally there was a top, there was the first the three, three winners so three had to get big trophies, and, te oh. and, and Terry came in and he said, Danny Doherty must have been smiling. <laughs> oh, so I, so I probably ended up having to buy them a drink. For, no, uh, no, no, but the, the, the big tro you, you, you'd have had to provide three big trophies for the winners <laughs> instead of one. Thank God, all donations gratefully accepted. <laughs> <laughs> you're, so, oh. you're so desperately in need of, uh, of the support. Oh, that is for sure. <laughs> a little more always helps to say, you know. <laughs> You've got a good grounding, Danny, in your, in your oh. first class. <laughs> oh, that is for sure. Actually, yeah. my trophies for my fesh are all yours as well. The onion oh. week belt and the Celine Penny Cup. And Celine Penny Cup is it's huge. Yes. And I bought those at your house um, when, when I just... You know, your fesh was just fabulous. Do you, do you know, it was just, I can still remember myself and Mary, Matt, Mary and Matt Roy coming out and it was icy and the, two of them slipped and I slipped and the three of us fell on top of each other. Oh, I remember that now. And That's I can, a long time I remember ago. remember Mary, Mary McElroy was on top of me and I was penned out and she was, and I, all I heard when I, was you saying, Jesus, 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 she's dead. And I, there's no compensation. <laughs> <laughs> Someone That's was, saying, I was worrying about. Is she awake? Well, there's no way she can't get any compensation. Jesus, 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 she's dead. <laughs> oh my it was, God. It was like a rugby scrum. The two of them <laughs> landed on top of me. <laughs> but I remember you had a very big, heavy coat on. <laughs> That's what saved you. <laughs> you remember that? I forget who was to my right, but Mary McElroy was to my left, and the three of us just one slipped and dragged the rest of us down a hill. <laughs> I was probably thinking to myself, and under Jesus, where did these from? <laughs> but it was when I came round, I didn't know. I was laughing so much when I heard Jesus, 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 she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine me saying that. And there's nothing she can get. <laughs> God, I'm not. Oh, Danny, it was fun. That face is still running. We're 40, I think we're over 41 or two years running that face now. It's the oldest face in, in the Midlands. Yeah, it's a great face. And, it just, and and staying in your house, you know, um, John is so lovely. Your, your partner, John, your husband. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, but you, you've, you've seen a lot of changes over the years in Irish dancing. I've asked everybody, I think, because of a question I saw Niall O'Leary bringing up on Facebook about open platforms. What do you think of the, the, the situation with open platforms, Danny? You know? Well, uh, I think it would do no harm uh, in certain areas uh, where there is a mixture of uh, Kogol and Commission. I have the fish and dairy uh, 
where they all dance together in the Kogol and commission adjudicators uh, in the dairy column killfish. And there doesn't seem to be any great, you know, it all seems to work out for them. And I don't feel why, if there's other areas that has, yeah, yeah. you know, that Kogol and commission yeah. wants to hear having a, a fish or a competition, you know? Yeah. So some I, that there's very, think, few, very little competition. I think why it didn't happen more was um, commission went when the split came and the commission seemed to have jumped in style and steps and everything. And Kogol stayed the same, yeah. more traditional. Yeah. And then as time went on, the gap got wider. And then when it would come to competition, uh, there was no comparison between uh, the Kogol dancing and the commission. But of course, that now has changed. Yeah, it has. Over, over the years. And the, the older members of and Kogol uh, are not really in the roost anymore. And the younger members are progressing and, uh, and moving on and moving with the times and as so that should be the, the situation. Yeah. We have so now, on. now they're back up again, and you know, I think if the opportunity is there, why not? You know, yeah. that's my opinion of it. Yeah, no, I think everyone that that I've said it to so far have have been the um, because I I think we're we're I think everyone is stronger together than than divided. Do you know? Um, yeah, but we could never we could never amalgamate completely. Because uh, Kogol has grown so much now that uh, we would never be able to fit it all in. No. Imagine it, having a world so, championships with all of Kogol and Commission as well. Oh. It would go on for weeks. Uh, yeah. Danny, be, if you were supplying the trophies, imagine. Oh, well, I was. I do supply. I know, supply but for Kogol and Commission oh, for the, a, a combined world. <laughs> I, I wouldn't have to worry about a mortgage or anything. No, you'd be rich. <laughs> exactly. So I'm still trying. <laughs> You're doing a very good job. <laughs> but uh, uh, what was I going to say? How how have you seen Irish dancing change over the years? Because, I mean, when you started, there wouldn't have been Kogol and Commission. There wouldn't have been the split. There would have just been on Commission. I mean, when I started, it was just on Commission. And then, yes. then Kogol happened. And... We grew up not not even knowing Kogol existed yeah. really, um, or that there was anything other than commission. And my best friend, uh, one of my best friends, her daughter was commission, and the teacher went back to Kogol, and so she went with her, and no idea that they were actually commission that they had gone back Kogol. Um, <coughs> so you know, I, I don't think <coughs> the dancers themselves ever know what organisation they're in, other than they're competing. And, there's a certain time that you actually, it, it materializes in your brain that you're actually on Commission or Kogol or, or, or what CRN or whatever, do you know? But yeah. what, how has it changed apart from the, the steps and that for you? And has it changed for the good? Do you think that it, it you know, that, that there's certain elements of the past that we should embrace once more? Or, uh, or, is, or, or are you all like June for progression? I, well, you cannot stop progression and you cannot stop progress. Uh, and I think Although if you're not, very much you, you need to be, and when you're in it at a high level, um, you don't realize the changes that you're making mm. or doing. It's only when you step back and think of what the we're doing or look at something that was recorded 10 or 15 years previous and see the difference in what you were actually doing then and what you're doing now. Uh, but when you're in it and working at a high level, um, you don't realize the changes you're actually making. But as somebody said, you know, the, uh, we're training athletes now, you know, they've got to be so strong and they fit and yeah, and we spend as much time now in the class 
making sure they don't get injuries with uh, doing stretches and lifts and all that type of thing and warming up. You know, there was no warming. There was no. There was no warming up. No warming up. Up when uh, we were going to dancing. I never heard of it. Uh, but it is what it is, and uh, I think it's good that it's still so strong, and there's so many people still interested in doing it. You know. Mm. <clears throat> Do you think it's gone um, prohibitively expensive? for people or do you think that you know that it's relative really in the sense that you know any sport that's any sport and i and i don't see irish dancing as a sport i see irish dancing as an art form and uh, you know yes you have to be physically fit but no different than a ballet dancer you have to have good core muscles your your legs have to be toned you 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 know you have to have your warm ups and your cool downs. So I still see it as, and I like to see it as an art form rather than a sport. But in any sport um, that you you do to the highest level, tennis, golf, anything you have, there's outlays, um, and and a lot of outlays um, and a lot of travel and everything like that. And I kind of see that you know children are could be in danger of getting into trouble, but for the fact that they're put into something. And you'd rather spend your money on a healthy hobby for them or a healthy activity than seeing them in jail, you know, or going down the wrong yes. road. What do you um, think, Danny? <clears throat> well, you see, living here, uh, uh, I was saying in a foreign country, uh, and especially in a foreign country, <laughs> especially in the 60s and 70s when the immigration was very high coming from Ireland. You had a lot of young families coming and young people and getting married and uh, and those people filled our classes because they wanted to hang on to their, their Irish heritage. Yeah. And uh, whether it was music or dancing, uh, you always had a great a great turnover of people coming, you know, and. God, when I went to one of the first faces in Birmingham, there was a hundred two hands lined up to in a one competition, like you know. But uh, it was that strong, and Birmingham was very strong in in Kaylee and figure dancing, all and still is. Uh, it's, it's well known for it, but and uh, we go to the world, and. Uh, Maybe there'd only be 10 teams entered and six of them would be from Birmingham or the Midlands, you know. So that was a great, and that was all through immigration and that, you know. And then, of course, like everything else, it, it died a little But Then we had Lord of the Dance and the shows come along and that gave it another boost. How Not important do you think that they were for Irish dancing? Sorry? How important do you think the likes of Riverdance and and all the the shows that have come after Riverdance? I think it, Irish dancing. Well, I've got I've got two opinions on that. Yeah. Um, I think it was not being selfish. I think it was great uh, that it, people that knew nothing about dancing or whatever are always referred to it as an Irish jig uh, and made little of it. Yeah. Even in Donegal. When I danced, you know, it it was known like it was only the peasants that that did this cultural thing, you know. Those that had or thought they were better off, they yeah. didn't do they didn't do that. They were trying to learn how to play the violin and the, and the piano. You know, we never had one. <laughs> nor, nor likely ever to have one in those days, you know. Mm. But uh sorry for interrupt how many were in your family, Danny? Six. Six. Yeah, there were six of us, four boys and two girls. Okay. And there wouldn't yeah. be violins. I was, I was the second youngest. Ah. Yeah, I was nearly the baby. But anyway, uh, then, as I say, the show started up and it, it gave everybody a, a new respectability, if you like, to the outside audience. 
and you'd be asked to dance at cooperative shows that you'd never be asked in theatres and different things that were going on, uh, especially if you had a troupe like I had. Uh, dinner dances and would be, you could, you could nearly be out every night of the week. And, and we did earn money from them as well, and the dancers earned money mm. from that, you know, and that wouldn't have happened only for Lord of the Dance and River Dance. So, and then the, those that were actually in it were earning a good salary yeah. out of it as well. And that gave them something to aspire to when they were 16 and 17. Then the next thing they wanted to do was keep good and stay dancing and hopefully get into one of the shows. And, and keep fit, fit keep fit and, as well. Oh, keep fit. I mean, when Lord of the Dance started, oh, I could tell you, go back. The first music for Lord of the Dance, Mary Duffy was in my house. It's too long a story to tell you, but... No, go she, was on, go in, on. she was in my house. Uh, she was in between jobs, I think, at the time. And... Uh, her and I were been always very friendly. Yeah. We, we, we struck up a friendship on the first time I judged the All-Ireland. Um, I was just 31. Well, that's a long time ago now. Yeah, she's a great teacher. And how, and how I struck up a friendship with her then was we were judging the All-Ireland. And as usual, you know, uh, come the end of the night, Everybody disappeared and you're left standing in the hall. <laughs> and there was nobody left in charge for the judges to be taken to get a bite to eat or get back to the hotel wherever they were staying. Oh, you want something to eat? For God's <laughs> sake. <laughs> yeah. And maybe this would be 12 o'clock at night. So uh, we were standing there, me and a couple more of us that was judging this all out. I remember Noreen Duggan was one. She was just back from after coming back from the States. And I seen Ma Mary Duffy because I always admired her, her dancing, you know, or any shall go. Oh yeah, they were used to watch. They were brilliant. Yeah. And uh, I said to her, I said, do you know anything about arrangements for us getting a bite to eat or getting back? Oh, she said, uh, <laughs> I don't know, I mustn't have done them very well that day. Oh, I don't know, she said. <laughs> She said, we're not allowed, she said, to associate with the judges, she said. I said, never mind that, I said. Uh, I said, can you and bring us, get something to eat? I said, we want to get home. Okay, she said. So her and Matt, my lady, uh, brought us, the three of us, to get something to eat and got us to the hotel. And then she checked with us every night afterwards. And that's how I got become friends yeah with it's Mary, amazing you know. how friendships strike strike yeah up. you know yeah. and yeah. that that's as i say is going back but i'm 74 today uh you don't look a day I was, me. Uh, you're very kind Mary. and uh you know, I, was 30, I was 31 then so you can count along that is 33 years yeah she's a year older than me by the way i think Okay. <laughs> You'll kill me now. <laughs> you said that now, not me. <laughs> but no, I always admired, and you know, we, it's funny how things happen. Like then, years later, I used to be doing a few workshops in America, and Mary always did workshops the whole summer because the classes closed down in Ireland, and the two of us ended up teaching for oh about five years in the one workshop. Okay. In Denver. And, oh, I'd uh, love to see Denver. Denver Denver, and Hawaii and Florida are the three places yeah. I'd like to. We taught there together. She'd be upstairs and I'd be downstairs and then we'd swap over in the afternoon. And uh, camaraderie we had between us and what we were doing and what we were teaching and what we were... It was very enjoyable, you know. So, you know... Yeah, she's an amazing teacher and she was an amazing... Uh, um, for, uh, you know, to have in Riverdance, do you know, or, and then Lord of the Dance. Dance. Hmm. Wasn't she in so Riverdance that, first? So she, I wrong? I'll come back now to when. So she, oh, no, I no, said to her, no, I was chatting to her on the phone, 
she has nothing to do. I says, come down to my class. I said, there's plenty to do. So she says, oh, she said, I'm in between what I'm planning to do. And I says, in the meantime, she says, I you can come down. Anyway, making a long story short, she was in, down with me. But the third weekend or fourth weekend, she had come to the class. My phone went in the kitchen and it was uh, somebody from, an agent from Lord of the Dance looking for her and uh, asking her would she become the choreographer teacher for Lord of the Dance. So she looked at me and I says, grab it. So that's how that happened and that's how that stayed. And the music, the first music from Lord of the Dance came down the phone. There was a slip cheek section and Capriona and John Carey happened to be there and the, all off and created the first number. And that was the start of the Lord of the Dance. Yeah. Isn't but mind you, could have killed her later, later because I had a good, strong senior class. And when the Lord of the Dance got up and going, uh, of course, all minds was mad for it. And they were all champion dancers and about 10 of them joined Lord of the Dance. So that wiped out, wiped that wiped out more or less the top cream of the class, you know, the old age groups. So I had to start again. But anyway, that year I went back and Declan McHale won his under 11s and yeah. Helen Wilkins got second and I won the Cayley. So I thought to myself, well, it's not, all's oh, not lost yet. So I had a battle in my hands, you know, and you went back then, and this is where you got the kick. Uh, you know, when that happened, a lot of the begrudgers would say, oh, that's some finish now, you know, you, all the good ones are gone. Why are, so people, like, prove... why are people like that, though, Danny? I mean, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm one of these people who loves to see people succeed. I just really love to see success. And especially success when it's got the hard way, when people really work hard for it. I don't understand uh, why there would be begrudgers. I'm well, incredibly proud of you and incredibly proud of everyone in dancing. I'm proud to belong to Irish dancing. I just look up to people like all of you that I've interviewed so far, you know, for different reasons, you know, the, the immense yeah. talent and the immense drive that... That, ha that people have in Irish dancing to succeed yeah. and, to, and, and to teach our culture. Yeah, it, 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 I think it's a, it's, a, it's a talent you have or you haven't. I mean, I've seen loads of world champion dancers and I had a couple of them myself went to teach and they didn't quite really make a success of it. They could teach dancing, but getting them to the top. I've seen that happen so many times, you know. I think it's teaching dancing is a completely different ball game. I mean, you can be a great dancer and you're not, you needn't necessarily I mean, go going in my record, versa. I didn't get one cups, but I was able to dance and had a good understanding of rhythm and footwork and, uh, and had the ability to create 
so that's what got me through you know and you you're a businessman as well you know you ran you ran it as a business when when few when a lot of people were um a lot of children were seen irish dancing as a hobby you 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 and others ran it properly like a business do you know well it wasn't you see i i, I never thought of it as a business because if i ran it as a business uh there was definitely things i i wouldn't have done uh, i wouldn't have been as lenient with non-payers and i wouldn't have been as subsidizing this one and the other one yeah i think and, we've all done that and um, all that carry yeah. on you know? and uh yeah i never taught privates i never had privates i never never charged. no not in my own class never they all got in a line and they all danced and they all got corrected and down the line and um what do never you think of privates do you think you, you know i mean i know there are there are some children that that um well they can afford it they can afford the privates yeah. um and but you could have children who who are very talented as well who can't yeah it it's like everything else it's something that i don't particularly agree with because i think just because you have money uh shouldn't give you the right to uh uh what would you say <laughs> to, to, to uh, the advantage of having uh, of having yeah. a one to one yeah yeah, yeah. I, 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 i've mixed emotions about it i can see i can see it from both i almost seen it as a as a way of the teachers making making money uh yeah, but you know if you're in it if it's your only income as well i suppose yeah. people, of course i was i can see it from that point of view as well you know i can see both I, sides. Yeah, I, I was fortunate that that i never relied on dancing money for anything what money i got out of dancing i spent it on travel and uh buying me cigarettes and me diesel for my car do you still That's smoke the, danny i do unfortunately yes <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. Would you not but have been up by now knowing the, the healthy organization you belong to? <laughs> yeah, you I, well, I, when I, I say healthy, the fitness, uh, the fitness, uh, or the organization that puts such emphasis on fitness and the importance of fitness. And you're oh. there, you're, you're there puffing a cigarette in front of yourself. Well, they can't smoke in the class now. Oh, no, but years ago, you'd be able to have a cigarette in the corner, you know, but you can't do that now at all. I remember when I was helping Celine Penny out, Lord dressed her with her class for while I was doing my TCRG. Celine used to have the cigarette in her hand. Yeah, it's, it's just a flashback. Uh, the O'Rourke's didn't. He loved John. Uh, but Celine loved John Bantock. Uh, when when we uh, used to take the orders to Ireland uh, in the summertime, and we'd call with Celine. Celine always made sure that she had the fresh cream cakes and then the table laid. She loved her fresh cream cakes. And and the best shine out. Oh, she had help us. Yeah, I remember that. And I can tell you it wasn't for me, it was all to do with John. Like, you know, <laughs> it was a great time for him altogether. Of course, he was a gentleman, you know. But, you know, I said it to a colleague of mine, he's an absolute gentleman. He truly <laughs> is. He, he, You know, he really is. I mean, I, I remember that time we again that we judged your fish he couldn't have done enough when we were that's his nature. in your house could You'd not have, have done enough put up with me. Huh? You'd have to, be to put up with me oh sure you know i don't think you're that 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 difficult but except when i fell all i heard was she'd get no compensation here <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Get> her <lighter. laughs> but how do uh, you know where do you see yourself um going to now and dancing then you've done everything is it is yeah, now just a bonus well uh you've won like everything yeah like yes you think you're done and dusted but i still have a little class in wolverhampton yeah i i never gave give that up that was one of my first classes that's running 45 years Jesus, Danny. and uh, i go there every every wednesday evening as there's not that many in it but they enjoy what they're doing 
and it keeps me interested. And that's all I ever intended to do after the, I give away all the other classes. But, uh, and did you give those away as a conscious decision? Did you just say, oh, I'm, I, just, I'm just going to pair things back now to one yeah. class in Wolverhampton and then you joined with Rosetta? No, I was out of dancing for a while and Rosetta and I have always been friends. And, Lovely, isn't she? You know, we get on so well, it's unbelievable because we're so different in character in many ways and yet we're so alike in others. She's uh, but she's you know, she always, we're always friends, and I'd be at home. She'd always come down for an evening, her and Paddy, and maybe Lan, and we'd always have a night in, uh, maybe a couple of nights over the holiday period. Then, when this happened, so she arrived and she said, Now she said, You know what you're doing now? She said, You're coming up with me tomorrow. She said, I have a class. Oh, not in your life, I said to her. No intentions. <laughs> She said, you are, she said, she said, there's no way she says you're giving up, she said. Another, another Philip Owens. Uh, and Telling I everyone said, you're retiring and then going back. Well, I said, I have no intentions. So, she, well, she kept on and on and on. You don't say no to, I'd say, to, to Rosetta. <laughs> so at the very end of the holidays, after the five weeks, I said to her, well, maybe I'll go up on the last weekend. You know, the last week is going to be there. So I knew then I wasn't going to be going. So I went up for that one class at the end. And I went in and, uh, oh, she took a fine class. You know, she's a fine teacher. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Just, oh, my yeah, gosh, yeah. I kept saying to her, what the hell do you need me for, you know? Oh, my gosh, she is. You, you, know, have to, you know, you know. Sure. Yeah, so, so I went in anyway to the class and, she said, what do you think of that there? What do you think of that there? And what do you think of that there? And I said, do you want my honest opinion or what? Or I'll just say yes to please you. That's not what you're here for, she said, you know, in the strong dairy accent. And uh, <laughs> I, I can hear her now. <laughs> yeah. So I started looking at it and I said to her, well, you know, that there and pointed out a few things. I knew, she said, that wasn't right, she said. But she said I had to have somebody else to tell me it wasn't right, she said. So, uh, yeah, sometimes when you're too close to a child uh, dancing and you're seeing things, um, you almost, there's so many things you have in your head to tell them to do that you, that you can't tell them everything. And somebody else then that comes in with a fresh eye and says, and then they yeah. listen to, they'd listen to you before they'd probably listen to Rosetta because they're so used to Rosetta saying, do this, do that, do that, you need to change this. Yeah. And you might come in and just say something to them and straight away they get it because yeah. you're a fresh so I went, uh So I left it at that and uh, so then she, was, she kept on and on and on to me. So Don't she wore me down, I think, at the end. So the other thing about it was, you know, I, my house is only a 40 minutes drive from where she had the class. You know, and I, and I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe I could go up and the odd evening and keep my hand in, basically, and keep me in touch. But sure, one thing leads to another. And then the school opened and Karen Gleeson asked me to take on the daughter. That's how we ended up in Manchester. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So making another long story short. That's how that come about, and so now you're so, all teaching together. So we're, we're there now, and so I go up to Manchester maybe once a month. But in a sense, Danny, isn't that nice because you have a kind of well, the great you're thing no about longer it. now on your own. You're you. I know. I know you always taught with somebody at some stage, but yeah, you know, at least you have somebody, a, a, a kind of a camaraderie, if you like, um, when you're teaching. You know, you're not just teaching on your own. You know, you have somebody to bounce ideas off. Oh, well, to me, uh, the, the main thing to me is I don't have responsibility. Yeah. Getting rid of the responsibility of running a class, between entries, arranging this, arranging that, phoning and different things. Getting rid of all that, to go in now to Rosetta's class or go up to Manchester, I would go in, do what they want me to do and walk away and leave it. And everything else I can forget about. 
Mm. I'm not have to worry about holes, shredding, entries, all that goes with this administration. Yes, a lot of administration now, isn't there? Oh, it's just ridiculous. So that's used to take up your time and you're you always on the floor. for administration just alone. Sorry? You'd need a full day for administration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of your day. But um, where do you see yourself now, Danny? Um, uh-huh. uh, do you think Above the ground. Back, do you think you'll move back to Donegal? Where no. you started? Do you think you'll make a full circle and come back to where you started? Because no, I'm, no. I've, I've never seen it, but I know from, from, convers- uh, from people that your house is just almost a mansion, if not a mansion in Donegal. Oh, uh, I was somebody tell you. Uh, it was said to me, Mary, Mary, you should see the house. It's just exquisite. <laughs> you know, I have, no. I have house envy with Terry, uh, Terry and Philip and uh, Edward and Byron, their homes and their dogs, their three, three and two dogs. And, and their houses are just, from looking at Facebook, their houses are just uh, immaculate. So I have, I have house envy anyway, so. But I've heard your house is just... Oh, not at all. We ever told you that's a load of lies, Mary. It's just a very ordinary house. Yeah. And it's very comfortable and it's... um, it's, It was John's dream to build a Georgian house. We had a bungalow, which we still have up the road. And uh, we had had land down the road near the sea. And... uh, we got planning permission for it and it lay there for seven years. So somebody said this, if you don't use it, you'll never get it. They don't allow double, two-story houses. And it was his dream to build a Georgian house. And I says, if you want to do it, carry on and do it. So he designed the house and laid it all out. And that's how it happened. And He's got a great eye for uh, detail. Inter- yeah, and interior. He, he knows exactly. Has. Yeah, he has. He uh, he knows exactly what fits and what looks right, and uh, the period you do every room in, you know, whether it's Georgian style, French for the bedrooms, and different things. Yeah. He would go out and plan all that and get all that. And I wouldn't be bothered. You know, up in your place. <laughs> exactly, uh, but that was his just thing. They're making the money. <laughs> I was just supplying the money. <laughs> supplying the money, but so you won't. You you don't see yourself moving back full time to to Donegal. Well, unfortunately, you see. The best of both worlds, Danny. Yeah, uh, just a couple of years ago, you see, I had a brother living in the home place mm-hmm. in Clamani, and uh, I had another brother living in the village. He was married at six children. They're all rare and gone. Uh, so I, I visualized a couple of years ago that maybe I could spend longer. I wouldn't spend the winters there. It's so severe and so dark and the late nights and the rain battering the windows 24-7, you know. So... Uh, <laughs> Make it sound like utter misery. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I, I I still enjoy the couple of weeks in the Christmas. My you know, and with tour guide a big fire on inside. Please in Ireland, Donegal. With, with a big fire on inside, and you can hear the rain battering the windows outside. I love that, but there's only so long you can you can love it, like you know. Like a scene from Wuthering Heights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what got Fidelma Mullen came down the stairs. She went and she got a special bottle gown. To come down the stairs because she said she wanted to be uh what was who she, she i think it was maureen o'hara or somebody she wanted to be coming down the stairs <laughs> with this ball rebecca, gown rebecca, oh. rebecca by daphne de maurier where she comes down the stairs in the ball gown and he realizes she's wearing rebecca's a replica of rebecca's dress and she comes down this big spiral staircase that's the scene that i i can see now in my head with fidelma coming down the stairs in the ball gown <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, unfortunately, my two brothers died within 14 months of each other. Oh, God. And so that left a big gap. So it meant that there's nobody in the house in the village. There's nobody in the home place. And 
that put a different view and things all together, you know. So they were always there and looking after the land and different things. And you had someone to come home to. And and now you go home, there's nobody there. You're so my mother, God rest her, would say you're relying on the black stranger. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons why I'm desperate to get home to because you, you, I've got things going on over there and when I'd normally be going there four or five times a year it was not touching a thing but now that I haven't been there now for over 10 months it's a long time away and although I have neighbours you know and uh, they do contact me and let me know the things the things are all right like you know neighbours are great in rural areas neighbours are, yeah. are, are essential Good neighbours. I must, uh, you know, I had a great friend, um, Maureen Tuhi. Yes. Uh, and uh, her and Anya. I'm, I met them the first very world I went to in the mansion house. My teachers, Danny. Oh, no. yeah. yeah I well, were you in? Were you in the sixteen hand that Charles Moore was in and Anthony Costello? Um, they, 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 they did the Bridges of Ross, wasn't it? Yeah. For a carney, I would have. Uh, I think they were seventeen at the time. I would have been. I would have been. A, yeah. Well, then, they were the first Irish dancing teachers I met okay. outside Mary Duffy when the first world I ever went to. I met Maureen and uh, we were going for tea. You know, me being a pioneer, and Maureen, same. We ended up going to the, I think it was the supper room or something we went. And we have to sit at the table and we got chatting to them. And uh, he said, oh, she's coming to the Cayley. <laughs> so I said, oh, I don't know anything about a Cayley. Oh, come down to the Cayley, she said, in the mansion house. So I come down to the Cayley. Anyway, I'm standing at the side. She was doing, uh, they announced the 16 hand reel. And the first thing I was, lifted out of my feet with my arms with Maureen and dragged into the 16 hand and I swung around the floor. I didn't know whether I was coming or going until that dance was half, halfway through before I could find out whose partner I was with and who I wasn't with. She's so we, funny. I love her to bits. I love Maureen yeah. to bits. But she tells a very funny story about the first time they went over to meet you to to do a, to do one of your fetches and she was so, they were so long in costumes because Anya was speaking oh out. that's right and they were arrested and put into into yeah. a, a question and when she got back Anya was so particular about her clothes and everything yeah. and you, you heard Anya screaming upstairs and when you ran up the dog had eaten Anya's shoe <laughs> <laughs> that's right mischief and you were you had a birthday party for the dog <laughs> oh Enid had Giving him Mars bars outside. Yeah, yeah. So the thought that was hilarious. If it had been my shoes, it would have been fine. But Anya's, he had, he had Anya's shoes. <laughs> oh, can you imagine it? Can you just? Well, I'll, was... I'll tell you another little funny story. You know, Mooring and I became great friends. God rest after Anya died, and so we'd arrange travel together. Uh, we travelled so much together, Maureen and I, she thought she could rely on me and John. And it was a great threesome. We went to Australia one time. And uh, as you mentioned, the shoes, we uh, arrived in the hotel eventually in Sydney, cutting a long story short. And she said to me, come in, she said, and open up this case, she said. I can't <laughs> open it. And the first thing that fell out of it was these pair of shoes. And I said, sir, sweet God of Almighty, I says, <laughs> why don't you bring them shoes with you for? Or you'll not be wearing them. Shut up, she said. I took them out of the bin on my way out, she said. Leaving, <laughs> she said, the girls threw them in the bin. Them's my shoes for Ennis, for the class, she said. And if I didn't take them with me, she said, they wouldn't be there when I go home, she says. So now I have them with me, she said. Oh, thank God for that, I said. The heels and the leather was curled up behind. So, <laughs> She's a she's one spec she's spectacular, Maureen O'Rourke. I mean, the the, uh, the amount of things you could talk about, the funny things that she did. Do you know she's yeah. got one, she's blessed with one perfect husband. Do you know? Jack yeah, exactly. Is just 
he's just absolutely perfect. They're perfect for each other. They're so completely different. Different. And uh, and and they complement each other. But you know, I mean, we just, you know, I mean, I I remember when I I judged a fashion. I think you were judging it, and you were to carry my suitcase up for me up the stairs, and you were, Jesus, what's inside in it? I had about fourteen pairs of shoes. <laughs> I was there for about four days. My God. But you you, yeah. you carried the you, you said I'll carry your suitcase up the stairs. You it, it nearly killed it nearly killed. Oh, Maureen. Me. Maureen had seven new night dresses. In the case, all in polythene bags. <laughs> I said, one for every night. I said, "Oh, what a great crack!" Oh, Danny Doherty, I could talk to you forever. I truly could talk oh. forever. I don't think I, I'm looking at the clock here, and you thought you'd never oh. get through. You thought it, it's. You said to me at the start, it was fantastic listening to everyone else's shows. But I'll never be able to talk, and it's actually going on uh, half past. You came on at three, was, you came on at three we, o'clock, and it's going on half didn't. past four. We started, we started late. We didn't come on till quarter past three. Well, quarter past three, and it's now. Oh God! And we're doing, and we're doing, we're, we're and you're still, we're still chatting. <laughs> oh, I could. The stories I didn't tell you half the stories that I could have told you, but that's for another day. We'll have to have a part two. <laughs> yes, I'll tell you about my trips with Carol Scanlon and Annie Kidd around the country. Isn't she fabulous, Carol Scanlon? Oh, great personality. Isn't she just... Yes. She's, she's, just she's gone through a hard time with this lockdown, you know? And, yeah, I'm uh, worried about her. That's her, her business was closed up for all those months, you know? Yeah, I and didn't... Thank God she's revamped the place now and she's up and going again. So hopefully it'll... She'll stay, you know. Uh, I was worried she'd have to come out of it, you know. Yeah, here today, I mean, the, as I say, there was a woman crying on the on the radio. She's paying out thousands again for. She ordered the, the drink two weeks ago. Uh, they order every two weeks, uh, uh, and for the for the following two weeks, and then after now they're going to have to destroy every one of the bottles, everything that they bought, and pay for everything and God, i can afford that it's immoral it's absolutely immoral what's happening and you know people aren't being given any guidance i was supposed to be running my fish as were others um none of us can run them you yeah. can't take a chance when was your fish to be the last weekend in september uh, mine's supposed and to be and it's second. 18 years running this was its 18th year oh uh, and um and my Supposed to be the 9th and 10th of November. I haven't cancelled it yet, but I'm waiting to see what happens oh, in September. Okay, by then. I, 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 I'm I, not I, sure. I can't see the Irish people above anyone. I can't see the Irish people lasting much longer because we're not a nation of people who like to to be told what to do. No, sure, none of us do. No, no one does. But I think English people. I'm, I was born in England, but I think English people are more compliant. They they follow us. They they do what they're told a bit more. They're um, like you know, even when my mother, my aunt came over to England one time, she was standing. They were standing in a bus queue, and the bus came, and she ran, and she got on the bus, and my and there was a big long queue. She ran uh -huh. past everyone. She thought she was in Ireland, and my mother was mortified. She said. Chris, she said, you can't do that here in Ireland. You know, you just are in England. You just can't run past about 20 people in a queue to get on the bus. Uh -huh. We don't, we don't, we don't do um, uh, uh, queuing or we don't do rules as well as, as other nations in this country. You no. Know? And has the pubs not actually opened in Ireland? The pubs have opened, but they have to listen. I mean, the, the, the whole joke about this, Danny, is... A pub can open if it's serving food in a nine or, upwards. There, there won't be any virus then. The virus will stay away because you're, you're, you're actually spending nine euros on food. But you can't open a pub if it's not serving food. Oh. Well, I'd make, sure, I'd make sure you're serving food when there's just sandwiches. 
but, but you'd have to charge nine euros for the sandwich. That's the way they've done it here. It, it, the food has to be nine euros or more before they'll a actually allow the pub to open. No, oh, there's ways and means and the Irish are not slow in working it out. No, but this woman, was, <laughs> she was just, uh, you know, I just, and I thought of Carol and I thought of everyone that yeah. uh, runs a pub and I thought, Jesus, this is just, this is just, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's people, if they're, if they're not going to die of COVID-19, they're going to die of, of, of isolation and loneliness and depression and, uh, and suicide. Yeah, the reality of it. It, is, it has been a tough time all around. Well, I hope Patsy McLaughlin and I hasn't been listening too much to this sort of area, Philip, because uh, I have a feeling that they'll be disappointed that they didn't get uh, the laughs that they thought they were. <laughs> hey, listen, Captain McLaughlin says, I can't wait to hear Danny. I can't hear that. Uh, can't, I can't wait to hear Danny's interview. She said, "I'm going." Who to said that? Uh, Kathleen uh, or Patsy McLaughlin? Oh, did she? Yeah, she came in privately to me and said, "I, I I'm, I'm looking forward to Danny's interview." Mm -hmm. Well, she's one great lady, isn't she? And um, uh, she's got the highest respect from everybody around the world. Yeah. And uh, she opens her door to everybody, and her hospitality. Has been known down all down the years. I actually stayed in her house one time as well, but uh, she's a lovely, lovely woman. And I do anything to help you. I knew you know? her to see, and I knew her to salute. Um, but just, just one day I was looking, and I thought I'd like to introduce interview Kat, uh, Patsy McLaughlin, um, and uh, something about the woman always fascinating me she, she always struck me as a very interesting woman who had a lot um a lot uh, of uh, things to t to talk about in dancing who yes had, who had an important voice um and uh yeah and she was just utterly fascinating yeah you know i just was talked to a lot of sense mm -hmm. really she talked to a lot of sense level-headed yeah oh very good you know. very good and she's had some great dancers in her day as well, mm. you know, and she had a lovely school. Yeah. Of course, Jimmy's there as well, and uh, yeah, the daughter, and yeah. So I meet up with them uh, when we go to the commission meetings. And Chris. Yes, but uh, oh yes, and Philip and Terry lived with them for a while. That's right. That's, but that's the kind of where you see she, you know. Anybody stuck or needing a bed, she was always there, you know. But isn't that what is life is about? Uh, but isn't that the, isn't that really what Irish dancing is about? We yes, we're like a big, we're like a big the own house city. and all the all the people that comes through it from yeah. time to time. Yeah. Even I go up now on holidays, there'll be ones coming down to see me and probably end up staying a couple of nights for different people, you know. You're never without a place to go or without somebody to talk to when you're in dancing because, you know, wherever you go in the world, you can meet somebody that's in the dancing world and straight away you're, you, you have a sense of belonging. Yeah. You always bring the teacher's book with you in case you get stuck and someday not too far away. I do. I bring the teacher's book with me. Yeah. I remember going to win the ball to a fesh one day. Um, we were judging and we... we um, I forget who we were. It was somewhere in America, and they hadn't come to. They hadn't arrived, and and straight away you were able to bring out the book and get their phone number and ring them. It was great. Yeah. Because it's like turning. I suppose I I equate it to being like a big city. Um, Irish dancing is a a, a global city that we've made into a village. Right. That's yeah. one way of looking at it. Yeah, because we, you know, we all know each other on some level, whether it's, I think, that, you know, what I find interesting about these little chats with people is that you're getting to know people beyond Irish dancing. Yes, that was one thing about the selling of the medals and trophies. It put me in an awful lot of contact with people, you know. Yeah. And uh, I mean, when I would go off, people would order in for the summer what they needed for right through to Christmas and we used to fill the car 
and we'd end up leaving here and our first customer would be Erno Daly in Dublin to meet us off the boat. And then the next customer could be Maureen Tuhi and down to Jimmy Smith and up to Mrs. Mulcahy, God rest her now. Rest her, yeah. And uh, they were all lovely, like, you know, and Dot Redmond and Mayo Redmond, yeah. was one of my first customers. And, uh, you, you know, you, you did the delivery and then you were asked to stay and you couldn't always, you know, because uh, you're battling time, like, you know. But uh, it was a great way. I got to know an awful lot of people very, very well through the business, you know. And, uh, it was, you know, it was another, another outlet, if you like, you know. Yeah. Do you have, a favorite, the, do you have a favorite moment in Irish dancing? Favorite moment? I think, I suppose, start of my real success would have been the world in Galway, where Catriona won our first world, and John Keary, and uh, the Cayley. It was my first time to win a world, and we won three in the one day. And there were 69 in the under 13 Cayley. I think it was the largest Cayley was held on those days. And winning those three, I felt, Jesus, Daniel, you have made it. <laughs> Little knowing, and I thought then I thought to myself, now you can give up. Now you you've been there, done that. You and the boys, the girls, and the Kaylee, you can wrap it all up now and go home. That was my thinking, you know. And uh, but little did I know, I came back then, carried on like you know. But yeah. I would say that was the start, and then another world we're at. <coughs> I won thirteen worlds in the one week. Danny. And uh, I, I always remember that. Uh, we won the eight, the, all the Cayley competitions, mixed and unmixed. And that was hard to do. You always missed out on one. Maybe it could be the seniors or the girls, you know, that was a strong that couple. One that you missed out on, or do you think of the 13 that you won? <laughs> Sorry? Do you think of the 13 that you won that week or do you think of the one that you lost out on? <laughs> no, uh, no, that was all I had, team-wise, you know. So that was my best. And then, as I said to you, I got seven seconds one year and one first and went back the next year and, you know. You were probably... So there are just days like that, you know, or times like that you remember. The rest of it is, I couldn't tell you anything about it. My past students and all that would be able to They say, oh, Danny, do you remember this? Danny, do you remember the other thing? And then they start in and start telling you, and you do remember, you know? Yeah. So, and I'm in contact with the majority of them, you know? And they're all quite good in the ring up. And this lockdown came on. They were ringing me to see, did I want any help or shopping done and all that and that was nice you know Isn't that lovely yeah you know so uh some a lot of them you know didn't forget where they came from like you know there's plenty of others that did there's all there you're always going to get that any in every world yeah. um and you just have i suppose you just have to accept it Do you know yeah. it, it comes with it, it comes with the territory i suppose but Danny Doherty, you have been sublime. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. You know that. And I just, you know, I, I, I'll be thinking now and uh, later on of your of your voice because, uh, you know, all I ever thought of was... Well, don't you ever think I kept me Donny God accent? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's dead. Don't you ever think I kept me Donny God accent all these years? Oh, it's, am it's amazing. My grandmother lived in, in London uh, for over 50 years and she was as Welsh as the day she came out of the Rhonda. There you are. And you, you, I think you can lose it if you want to lose it. And if you don't... Yeah, I suppose that's right. You know, but some, yeah. it was, some people, it's so ingrained in them anyway. and it, it is their identity and they don't want to lose it. And, you know. But, Danny, I hope you enjoyed our little chat today. I certainly did, and it was a pleasure talking to you. Oh, sure. 
we'll talk again because I feel there's a part two and a part three and a part five in Danny Doherty. Oh my God. I never told you about the homemade bread they used to bring to the class and a big lump of butter in it. I used to think to myself, God, I'm back at home in school with a country scone made. John McCarn's mother used to a great baker. And every we, you know, have used to have uh, a tea break. Yeah. In every class. And uh, they'd all arrive in with the homemade stuff. Carol McCarn, God rest her, would come in with the with the scone and a big lump of butter in it. And we'd sit there with a cup. Straight away you're back home. And back, I felt I was back at home and then took the rest of the scone home with me. <laughs> Anyway, I kept you long enough. No, you haven't. Yeah. I could have talked to you forever, Denny, but I'm just conscious. It's your birthday and you've given us so much of your of your birthday. No, so, you're... Happy birthday, Denny. Happy birthday. <laughs> you're so kind. And the hair anyway, comes to I'm you. Glad, I'm glad that I took you on. I thought to myself, it's known to Christ. I, I'll never get through this, but sure. It was just a chat. We may as well be sitting beside the fire. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cathy, Cathy McLaughlin said that. She said it was like sitting at the fire having a chat. Yeah, which is great. You know, that's what you want. You just want, yeah. to, you just want to find out people's stories. I love listening. I, you're, I just admire you all hugely. And dancing has been my passion all my life. And I just, I, I can just bask in all your glory. Uh, that's so nice of you. No, but... Um, Thank you, Danny Doherty, and happy birthday. And here's to another 70, 74. Oh. Here's to another 74. <laughs> you know. You're very kind. God bless. Bye, Marion. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Slong.